Coming up on Digital Music Trends, we break out some virtual champagne for episode 200, recorded on the 10th of September 2014. Featuring news from almost every major streaming provider, we are shocked out of our summer lull by Apple and U2, Wimp, Deezer, Spotify, Ardio and Twitter. The show features special appearances from the Chief Commercial Officer of Wimp and the CEO of Music X-Ray, as well as a fantastic panel of guests from CD Baby, Your Turn and SF Music Tech. This week's show is brought to you by Play MPE, providing secure music distribution and promotional services to the world's largest labels for over 10 years. Play MPE can be accessed on Windows and Mac computers, iOS, Android and BlackBerry mobile devices. Find out more on plaympe.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Lionelli and this is a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and uh, this week, uh, you know, it's a real pleasure to be here with uh, uh, three fantastic guests. Uh, we have uh, uh, Kevin Bruner on the show, Director of Marketing at CD Baby. So hi Kevin and thanks for joining me, how's it going? Hello, thanks for having me. It's great to have you and uh, we have uh, uh, Olivier de Simone uh, on the show, VP of Business Development at Your Turn. So hi Olivier. And thanks for joining us. Hey, yeah, thanks for inviting. And uh, we have Brian Zisk, uh, the founder of uh, SF Music Summit uh, uh, and uh, SF Music Tech Summit. Oh, how could <laughs> I get that wrong? And the founder of uh, Future Money and Technology Summit. So, hi, Brian, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? It's going great. I actually didn't do the normal intro where I go through all the paces because we have such a packed show. And it's a pretty special episode. It's a number 200 today. So I'm, I'm really hoping it's going to be uh, good. And we have a mountain of news to cover. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, I think the gods of podcasting are uh, both uh, uh, shining upon me and also testing me to see if I can actually uh, condense all of this into a one hour show, which should be fun. And I guess, uh, you know, guys, we're going to talk about uh, all that you're up to through the show so we'll definitely make time for that but i want to uh, open by talking about apple of course uh, you know i i hope that people that are listening won't switch off uh, at this point but uh, uh we know we kind of we gotta talk about this youtube business and uh, uh, of course if you unless you have been living under a rock for the past week and uh, dmt is your only point of contact with the world in which case uh, <laughs> i congratulate you on your, on your tastes uh, but uh, you know unless that happened uh, you will have heard about uh, the apple announcement that happened yesterday where they unveiled the iPhones and the Apple Watch but we'll chat about the hardware a little bit later perhaps uh, as, as a side note uh, you know the real big news for the industry side of things is the fact that uh, Apple partnered with U2 and uh, essentially at the end of the keynote announced that they were going to distribute U2's new album uh, Songs of Innocence to over 500 million iTunes account for free uh, it's kind of an imposed uh, uh, album in the sense that it will just appear on your account uh, w you know whatever uh, your preferences may be and uh, you know it's, it's uh, what's seen as the largest album distribution maneuver in history, essentially. So uh, there's a lot to talk about here uh, around this uh, this uh, release. Uh, first of all, uh, a first round on uh, is this bad for the industry and does this reinforce the notion of free? I think that's one of the first questions that people have been uh, uh, asking around this. So, uh, Kevin, any, any thoughts on that? Well, uh, Bono did make it clear that Apple paid for it. So, right. <laughs> and actually, if you go to YouTube's website, there's an interesting post by Bono where he emphasizes that fact and explains that it's important for people to buy music for the future of uh, other musicians, and that that was why it was really important for them to 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 make sure that point was made clear. Um, <laughs> as, but you know, for them, it, they got a nice big payday. Uh, exactly. And it got their music out there. I thought the most interesting thing to me is that something that uh, Bono said was that uh, we want as many people to hear this as possible. And I know they were they were disappointed with the the release of the last album. Yeah. Didn't do well at all. Didn't connect with the fans. And to me, I think it really more struck to the 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 chord of what artists really want. And I think is. Uh, beyond money, it's yeah. that they want more people listening to their music and enjoying the the art that they suffered through to create. So, um, well, but you know, you two, I'm not going to cry for you two that they the last album didn't do well, but yeah, I'm exactly. sure it's a great move for them <laughs> and uh, to kind of get their name back out there in kind of an explosive way. Exactly, it's kind of hard to say no to, right? You know, you, you get probably yeah. like a, anywhere between ten and thirty million dollars check plus exposure to so many people. Uh, Brian, what do you think when you saw when you saw that happen? Well, I mean, what industry are we talking about? Are we talking about 
the recorded music industry or are we talking about the U2 industry? Because for the U2 industry, it's clearly a win-win. Now, when people talk about who's getting paid, I don't think people transfer the fact that it's free to them, but YouTube is, U2 is getting paid. I don't think that means anything to the public that U2 yeah. is getting paid. I think it's, it's, you know, it's perceived as a free album. And that's tough for the industry because people have a limited amount of resources and they're competing with everything from their cell phone bill to their, you know, the candy at the store to pretty much anything. And when they know that, you know, they're getting music from the biggest band in the world, not just them, but everybody is for free, it becomes much harder for people to justify that spending that music on other acts that aren't as big. Yeah. So it's is it something that you two should have done for you two? Obviously, because they don't do anything that's not in their own self-interest. And in reality, <laughs> they're probably going to make more money off of their tour and their their pay-per-views and, you know, all of these things. I mean, not to mention that they're getting a, they're probably getting more from Apple than they would from selling this on the open oh, yeah. market. <laughs> so uh... clearly it's a win-win for them, especially in the staying relevant in the marketplace game. Yeah. Is it a win-win for the entire industry where now it is forever going down that the biggest album of all time was given away for free. free. Yeah. Not a win-win for most people. Win-win for Apple and YouTube and people who otherwise would have paid for the album and now can hear it without listening to it. Yes, but the thing that's really interesting to me that I think we won't know what happens until later is you look at the declining sales of U2 albums and they have been dropping off a cliff and my hand wasn't in there dropping off a cliff <laughs> apparently even greater than the rest of the industry so how much would this have sold otherwise versus first off this big benefit from working with Apple but then after the exclusive is over they're, I believe, going to sell this through the other channels, yeah. through all the other services, and through physical as well. And it's very likely that in addition to this huge win, even without that part, that the promotional boost that they get from this program will cause them to sell more and make more even otherwise. So for you too, it was a no-brainer, but, you know, for the rest of the industry, we it's like, yeah, yeah. wow. Thanks, guys. And, and Olivia, for, from from with your industry hat on, of course, uh, Olivia worked for years at the Orchard as well, uh, and you know, a company that that sold music essentially. Well, how, how do you feel about this? Is is it just a brand U two thing, uh, as Brian suggested, that it's got nothing to do with the industry as a whole? It's just something that U two can do because it's U two. Yeah, I think you know, like U two. Well, we can only respect a band that is has been like for so long in the industry and and what what a career. Um, I have to say, like, yesterday I was a bit surprised and, and uh, I had two feelings. The one was, uh, is it right from Apple to do that? Uh, coming with something where you download an, app, uh, um, an album, where, in my opinion now, we are clearly in a new phase in the industry where the metric is the engagement. Yeah. So it's great to get 500 million people downloading uh, uh, an album. I find it personally a bit intrusive to get this on my iPhone today. Uh, but then second question is like, so how many people are going to listen to that? Is it really giving value to the piece of work they did in a, in a, in the studio? And, and my question was like, what about doing like the biggest stream ever instead? Uh, we know yesterday they got some problem with streaming uh, with the show, but uh, I was a bit surprised to, to get this as a, as a download. And also to like basically compulsory getting this album on my iPhone and my and my computer. Yeah, no, you make um, you make a great point there. I mean, I I if you search for the words YouTube and iTunes and delete, uh, there are hundreds of tweets st streaming uh, uh, you know every, every hour about people uh, from people that are uh, pissed off about this that don't want the album to be there. So, like personally, my playlist are like it's a long time. I don't use. Uh, 
iTunes anymore, but like it's extremely personal. Yeah. So having something coming in my in my world of music is a bit uh, bizarre. Yeah, I mean uh, that, that you know I I thought that as soon as they announced it, I was like, really, you're just gonna it's just gonna appear, and a lot of people like like ourselves perhaps you know use Spotify and, and other services as the primary way of consuming music these day, music these days. And I, I personally don't have any albums on my iTunes, so actually now the YouTube album is the only album that appears in my iTunes <laughs> library. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm not sure how good of a thing have it is. You guys that, listen that's to that's the how album. they're gonna pull you back in, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. When when I accidentally press uh, play on my Bluetooth Bluetooth head, headset, uh, the YouTube album is gonna start playing because that's the only album I have in my library. So yeah, that, that that's gonna be fun. Uh, you know, of course, it doesn't download automatically. You have to actually go and press the download button to get it. It's in your cloud. So okay, that's that's fair enough. But yeah, it is a bit of an intrusive move. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask about is is about the the beats side of things because uh, uh, this is sort of the first sign of the tie-up between iTunes and Beats because the company actually got the exclusive of the stream on the album uh, for the duration of the <coughs> Apple exclusive which lasts until the 13th of October uh, so uh, you know what do you make of this do you think that Apple might be thinking about doing more of these also to help the Beats music brand to uh, to get out of the shell and uh, get more subscribers anybody want to take that well, I know a lot. Of, I, I saw a lot of people commenting right after it happened that they thought Beats kind of got the shaft in the whole thing because um, they really didn't. They it, it wasn't until afterwards they realized that it was going to be available on Beats as well. Right. Um, but uh, I, you know, I have a feeling that Apple has big plans for a better tie-in for them. It's just that Apple doesn't rush anything. Yeah. And so there'll be some better. Uh, you know, music events. It's iTunes is so due for a complete overhaul anyway. I have a feeling that they've got their sights on some announcement probably early in the spring or something of a whole new music ecosystem with iTunes and Beats and, and all that. But uh, yeah. yeah, it was, it did feel like when watching it that Beats kind of got the shaft. And it, actually, what I really enjoyed was watching all the people I follow that work over at Google kind of <laughs> moaning as this unfolded. <laughs> Since nice. uh, they didn't, uh, especially when Bono made the comment about. Uh, we want to get it to the most people possible. And someone said, well, you should be releasing it on Android then. <laughs> and uh, so there was a lot of comments about that, too. That's funny. I should have, I should have followed that list on Twitter. That would have been funny. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I guess uh, the, the other thing to talk about is the fact that the iPod uh, Classic has been discontinued, which is, uh, of course, 99.9% uh, .9 of people won't care at all about this. Uh, but it's it's signal sort of a... A shift in strategy from Apple, of course, uh, you know, this has been going on for years, but it kind of confirms, in a way, it kind of confirms the death of the MP3 in the long term. Uh, uh, and perhaps a shift to streaming uh, sometime soon. I don't know, Brian, do you feel like that's that's a, a sort of a correct... Uh... Well, well first, first in regards to Beats, <laughs> right. it's so early in the acquisition that I wouldn't even... Go there, yeah. take anything away from from that um you know and and because there is the tie-in of the streaming it does amplify i think there's there with ian and those guys it's going to be fine they're uh, still trying to we, pick out their offices right now they haven't even done anything beyond yeah, that <laughs> yeah i'm sure they're still dealing with hr um, <laughs> yeah. so so um you know then in regards to the ipod I don't think that's a big deal at all. I mean, I, I didn't I didn't follow exactly what they were discontinuing, but it was the classic. But I mean, I, I you know, I mean, everybody's got it on their phone. So I, yeah, I, I don't really think that the fact that you're discontinuing a single purpose device really says anything at all, except that demand showed that people would rather buy an iPod touch that could also be on the internet as opposed to an iPod that can't. So I don't yeah. I don't see any 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 significance. I, I was I was prodding you on that one cuz you know I don't think that either but uh, <laughs> I just wanted to make but the point and Plus the that. the new the new iPhones do have a uh, much larger storage capacity than yeah. they skipped the 32 gig and went to 64. So that's really annoying so, actually, isn't it? It's like why do you do 16 and then 64? Do 32 and 64? Yeah. It's like it's just being cheap at that point, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I think okay. you want to limit the number of options. And what I kind of see is, and it's interesting because you know I had a bigger iPhone, and then I won an iPhone in a raffle, a newer one, um, but it only nice. has 16 megs on it, and it's really interesting because it's no longer nearly the media device. I mean, it's great for streaming music, but 
you know, I had to throw away a bunch of apps. I had to throw away my, the movies. I had to throw away all of these things. So I think it really is splitting the market into, well, if you just want it as a phone that's on the Internet, but you don't really want it as an Internet storage device, you get the really little one. And if you really want, the other thing I will say is uh, the, the prices for additional storage have come down substantially. Right. Uh, it used to be Apple would charge a much greater differential for you know an additional sixteen you know uh, of RAM, and yeah. so uh, it's not that surprising to me that they have like the cheap model and then a model that actually works as opposed to tr having these sort of tweener yeah. models. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I was so glad that I got the 32 gigs two years ago. I was, I'm still on a 5, so uh, hopefully I will be able and to And I'll get. tell you, that's probably what's going to cause me to buy a 6. I mean, I right. won this 5C, and I love it in a lot of ways, but it's just not, it, it, you know. And I'll tell you, maybe I could have lived with it if I had started with a smaller phone, but transferring my data from a 4S that had more data to a 5C that is now overloaded, I have to, I'm really going to consider one of the sixes. Absolutely. Uh, Olivia, are you going to get a, a, an Apple Watch? We haven't talked about that yet. <laughs> you ask me this because I'm Swiss or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like. I, you guys are in trouble. My, <laughs> I could lose my passport saying this, but I, I never got any watch. <laughs> um, and uh, so the big question for me is like, do I need one? Right. Uh, because I just never got this. Um, I have to say, like yesterday, the, the show was like quite amazing, and there is tons of stuff like that are that are uh, amazing. Uh, I was really impressed with like everything about the the fitness and all that. And you're like, okay, I want to be better, etc. I think it's also we get a little bit older in our careers now, so it's not about how many drinks we get at meet them or source by source was but how much we run now yeah. the things we we share but um i'm not sure i want one yet but once you see it it's apple right so once you see it you touch it you're like okay and and you pay so i would i wouldn't be surprised if you see me with one <laughs> at some point <laughs> nice yeah and of course it's going to come out in january 2015 again for those that were uh, living under a rock for the last 24 hours it's so weird now with the news cycle it just feels like this feels like old news and it's happened like less than 24 <laughs> hours ago right it's so bizarre uh, <laughs> like i'm almost bored myself talking about it uh, and so uh, <laughs> in that sense maybe we should uh, switch to talk about one of the like uh, other five major news that we have to talk about today which is in insane and so uh without further ado actually i was going to talk about uh, uh, lossless audio so uh, first of all um the Norwegian music uh, service uh, WIMP uh, has unveiled a new service called uh, Tidal, uh, which is a high-quality, uh, high high-fi high uh, music service that will launch in the UK and the US later this fall, uh, probably in October uh, at some point, uh, 2014. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Tidal... Uh, is an interesting proposition because it's a very cool design. It's going to be a very high-end service uh, uh, catering to people that are, uh, care about sound quality. Uh, Wimp has got a library of, uh, uh, you know, over 20 million tracks that are at 44.1 uh, uh, kilohertz, so CD quality, 16-bit. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, they decided to target this uh, uh, market of people that are willing to pay $20 a month or £20 a month for their music. And I actually interviewed uh, Peter uh, Tonstadt, uh, the company Chief Commercial Officer uh, last night, and here is a short extra extract of that interview. It's a real pleasure to be here with uh, uh, Peter uh, Tonstad uh, from uh, the company WIMP. So hi, Peter, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hi there, thanks. Great. It's great to have you from Oslo. And so uh, the company had a big announcement this week, uh, really exciting stuff, uh, and uh, you announced a, a new service essentially called Tidal, which is going to launch in the UK and in the US uh, uh, this fall. So first of all, w when were the, the first seeds uh, for uh, Tidal planted and when you first started thinking about this? Yes, I think the first seeds, uh, I mean, the first seeds uh, come from our initial launch of streaming service back in 2010, when we had this emphasis on the manual curation of editorial, uh, trying to make a service that was different than other services uh, for the real true music lovers. And then understanding that sound is obviously an important part of that, uh, that let's say, offering. Uh, so we launched our WIMP Hi-Fi service yeah. uh, October last year. And when we saw the, the general initial interest around sound quality on streaming and for WIMP Hi-Fi, 
particularly. Then we started getting ideas and ambitions about geographical expansion outside of our current markets and realizing that um, what we want to do to stand out is to is to make sure we're perceived as the premium service for for streaming, uh, having the the creation part from before, adding the sound quality. We added videos in HD, adding other stuff in the future. We needed to be perceived as a very high-end service. And yeah, then we yeah. also recognized that WIMP as a brand name is probably a challenge uh, matching that market position in English speaking languages so sure. or countries. So so that's when we made the choice of, uh, of launching a new brand uh, with our Hi-Fi service in, in UK and US now initially. It's really exciting because it kind of... It feels like you have uh, uh, an altogether new design. It's a, a very slick, very uh, you know researched. So, uh, did, did you spend a lot of time figuring out how you wanted to position the design of the service as well? A lot. I think we always took design seriously, also from from Wimp. But yes, to make it, let's say, reflect all the brand values we want in this being a high end service, majestic, sophisticated as a kind of brand recognition linked to the name. Yeah. And we we put a lot of work into to making this look nice. Um, so making it, let's say, stand out as, as premium and yeah. the software. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so looking at uh, the service uh, uh, in, in the US, for example, you know, we, we've seen the success of Pono and uh, their second craft funded as well uh, on, for, the, for the actual financing of the company. And so did, did that sort of spur you on? Did that sort of validate the fact that, you know, there is a market out there for high-end music services? Actually, not particularly what's been going on recently in the US and Pono and that thing, because we launched our hi-fi in Europe uh, back in October so right. that, it was that traction that really motivated us to to look further ahead and, and look for expansion yeah. so I think we kind of proved our own case rather than looking around us uh, and when we now let's say go public with the first uh, bigger international uh, streaming service in, in high fidelity sound quality and the interest around it is from manufacturers on the hi-fi side it's from let's say hi-fi communities in general and people who, who like quality, that's, that's been our motivation. Absolutely, and I would imagine that's also going to be the focus on, of the rollout as far as uh, potential partners uh, are concerned, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And let's say in general, the interest we, we have from, from hi-fi manufacturers, well-known brands who basically for them, this is the only way of actually proving the capabilities of their great products with the sound quality so and they know that people will be using streaming to to fill those uh, those uh, the, that equipment and then there is a very interesting discussion to be had in terms of different corporations uh, yeah. giving that starting point absolutely and uh, you know the cool thing about the service is that you uh, sort of are basing the entire thing on 44.1 kilohertz which is uh, great and it means that essentially you get cd quality with every single release that you get on the service uh, uh, what are your thoughts on on going beyond that and uh, you know is there room for going beyond that and, and uh, do you think that you guys might go there at some point yes starting to talk about 24 bits versus 16 bits formats uh, uh, there's definitely market interest there for uh, for the very very let's say uh, high uh, segment or the the real sound connoisseurs but Many of the systems aren't prepared to, to yeah. manage 24 bit now, but but I think that everyone has it on the roadmap, and so do we. And we we will be adding 24 bit content uh, very soon, but then in more limited uh, add-on uh, catalog to the full, let's say, CD quality 16 bit uh, offering. Uh, so it's more a supplement, and uh, over time, maybe more and more will be even even better sound quality than CD. But I think. The, the initial uh, hi-fi format as we have now is a, is a fantastic evolution in itself. We are now giving people the opportunity to listen to, to music in, in CD quality, which should be a, a requirement on, uh, on, on, let's say, from an artist perspective, that's the way the music should be listened to. And that's, that's actually a quote from Bob Lefset yesterday in his uh, newsletter saying that uh, for him, this was a really, really nice new experience to to listen to stuff in, in CD quality on the streaming service. Obviously. And uh, finally, I want to ask you about, of course, uh, I, I wrote in a piece uh, this week the fact that uh, Aspiro, which is the company that uh, uh, owns Wimp, essentially it's a, it's a public company, which is quite a rare thing. It's pretty unique for a major streaming service to be part of a public company. So did that sort of influence the way that you're going about the rollout? Because uh, essentially, of course, being a higher priced and higher end service, you probably have a, 
you, you're not going to incur the same losses that, for example, a service like uh, Spotify or Deezer are incur in their price point. So uh, was that also like a motivation to launch it as a high definition service at a higher price point? Uh, not particularly any right. specific link there because uh, obviously being a public company, then you have a, a vehicle to, to also get additional funding. Sure, uh, of course. But then it's more a question of which priorities do we do at any given time. And, uh, and for us, it was more uh, experience of competing in a very tough market where we did launch. Back in 2012, we launched a freemium model in some of our markets. Yeah. Uh, but we felt that that really didn't really change anything. It just it just became another, let's say, free music offering in, in these markets. And for us, that was less interesting. We need to do stuff that's different, that stands out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Towards bigger competitors who, who now, let's say, have um, a strategy of, of grasping as many consumers on board as possible using the premium model. So if we can, we can, let's say, play on a different playing field saying we want to talk to people who really care about music and sound and they will have a higher willingness to pay as well. Absolutely. And uh, uh, Peter, it was such a pleasure having you on. I'm really excited about the service. I think it's, it was a brilliant move uh, on your part. So uh, good luck with it. And it's at tidalhifi.com uh, for anybody that wants to check it out and sign up for the uh, pre-release uh, uh, access as soon as the uh, service is released later this fall. Uh, thanks again, Peter, for your time. Great. Thank you. And so uh, Wimp has made a really interesting move here. Uh, I, I've, I, I'm pretty stunned by it in the sense that, you know, it's just like it's... it's I thought it was genius, uh, you know, when I when I read it. It's like makes sense. There's no point competing on, on the low lower price service. Let's just go for the high end service and try and partner with some uh, high end audio manufacturers, uh, you know, of, of speakers, of headphones, and, and try and get the momentum going from there. So. Uh, I want to tie, the, uh, tie this actually to the second news uh, that is in the high, high definition streaming space, which is the fact that uh, uh, Deezer literally four hours ago announced the fact that they're also going to release uh, a high definition streaming service in the US uh, on the 15th of September. Uh, this is going to be completely tied to Sonos. Uh, it's going to cost again $20 a month. It's going to be the first foray of Deezer into the uh, uh, US market. And uh, it, it's going to be available internationally, of course, uh, the, the, uh, this Deezer Elite service. But uh, for the US, it's going to be the only thing that's available for now. So uh, taking these two news and sort of spinning them around uh, any way you like it, uh, uh, Olivia, uh, anything to say on that uh, and, and sort of this rise in interest in, in high definition music, which is high definition relatively because we're talking about CD quality, not higher than CD. I, I think it's extremely smart to to find like another angle to, to come in the market because um, it's interesting if you see like Wim, for instance, in, in Scandinavia, uh, is been there for quite a long time with an offer that is really different, but you are in the territory of Spotify, yeah. uh, and still they found an audience. It's not like massive, but uh, you you really have an audience for them that are like probably more into classic, a bit older. Uh, they love to get the editorial that w Wimp is providing, and uh, and you have an audience to that. So probably through some partners into the Hi-Fi, etc., they, they they have a way to scale in other territories and um and uh, obviously i don't think they're like then comp competing with uh, a spotify or like uh, soon beats in the us um for deezer it's a very different uh um uh scenario where they literally exploded in france and then did an incredible sprint to uh, launch in uh, many many countries yeah. Um, and um, doing, doing also a lot of deals with telco in the U.S., the question is like, okay, we want to get there, but uh, Spotify is here, iTunes is huge, there is also audio, there are like so many players, how can we do something different? Um, and uh, they have like a financial behind that are strong, so I think it's, yeah. a, it's a great uh, angle to, to get there, um, and uh, obviously it will... It will still need quite a lot of uh, marketing power to to get your brand existing in the U.S. because I, I don't know many Americans in my friends that know Deezer yeah. except in in uh, in the industry. Exactly, yeah. And, and uh, Brian, this is kind of a interesting two services that look very similar on the surface. Uh, the price point is the same. The, the audio quality, I think, is, is going to be around the same. It's flak for uh, for Deezer, and uh, but a very different uh, market uh, entry strategy. You know, uh, <coughs> Wimp with Tidal is uh, going to be uh, available on app as well. I'm sure they're also going to be available on, on a variety of hardware devices. And Deezer is just locking itself into Sonos. Is, is this just that in order to get a market? Because if Sonos pushes this, then they can get into those homes. 
Well, I mean, first off, I'm thrilled that Flack is finally coming around. I mean, right. we actually spun the Ziff Foundation off of our startup long ago, and it was really interesting because Apple crushed a lot of our formats. I mean, the formats really moved forward, but since Apple refused to adopt them because they didn't own any rights in them, they never caught on. So now that Flack is coming around, this is fabulous. It's way better than MP3. Higher quality audio is a good thing. We really have to have no way to know, but many people suspect that part of the drop in music sales has been that music just doesn't sound as good when you're listening to it in one of these, you know, compressed formats. And, you know, as we can see from Neil coming out with Pono and you can see from RDO launching their higher quality service, I mean... Uh, you know, and I have to assume that Beats is going to come out with a higher quality service. I mean, everyone is because, you know, bandwidth is bigger and better and all of this stuff. So I think it's great. Do I think it's a winning proposition in and of itself? No. I mean, I sort of disagree with Olivier. You know, it's like people have certain budgets and... You know, and if I since I've got my Beats subscription, I mean, I'm the guy who'll probably sign up to check out. But, you know, I'll sign up first for the 30 day trial. And then if I find I'm never listening to Deezer, you know, whatever. And if I find it's a better service, I'm going to use it. So really, it's a market entry point, but the proof will be up against the other competition. And so, I mean, it's really interesting. Like, and one of the problems I see with a lot of these services is they sign these deals with the labels and no one really knows how much the labels or the artists are getting paid. Yeah, and I mean, sure. I think that's one of Bandcamp's success is, you know the artist is getting the vast proportion of the money. And I kind of would like to see these guys out there saying, no, uh, we have the better deal with the, with, with the artists getting paid. Because I think while there's real concern about that, otherwise it's like, oh, well, Beats is pre-installed on my on my computer or Deezer comes with my, you know, with my ISP subscription and it's going to be a battle for the marketplace and it's really difficult to fight on the we are going to pay the advances to get the distribution to be the mass service. So it comes down to what's the real economic business model and how do you get to a sustainable business place without spending yourself out of business. And yeah. it's going to be, I mean, I'm very much looking forward to to checking out Deezer. And the other one, I know WIMP is not the best name for the U.S., so they're launching under, what, what's their other Tidal. name again? Tidal. Yeah, I mean, that's a much better... I like it. It's like a disaster movie. It's like, I don't know. Yeah, but it's the tidal <laughs> wave of music. I tidal mean, wave of music. Stuff. The day after tomorrow, And right? we'll try it out, but it's still going to be hard to get the mind share away from what comes with your AT&T yeah, cell yeah. phone subscription, what ships on your Apple and or Samsung device, or what, you know, and you got to look at, at the reality of the situation and does it end up costing you more than you're going to make from the people who keep using your service. So exactly. I think it's great they're coming in, but really it's going to be how effectively can you market and get the mind share or else you probably won't make much of an impact. Yeah. Yeah, Kevin, uh, on your front, uh, on the City Baby front, uh, it's quite interesting to hear your take as as a distributor. I mean, I I th seem to remember that all the streaming services receive the files lossless, or at least at the highest quality, you guys have it, and then they compress yeah. it at their end, right? So it, it, theoretically, they all have the 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 capability of of, of doing a CD quality service. Uh, most of them, yeah. Most we do do some conversion before we send it to some of the places. I mean, the interesting thing about high res is we've actually been selling FLAC files on CDBaby.com for a long time, and I think the biggest hang-up kind of taps into what uh, Brian was talking about is that for some of the you know the average user, if you're not like an audiophile that knows how these other formats work, sometimes it's really a pain to get them on your device. Right. Um, and if you know if you're streaming in high res, uh, you know that I'm I'm hoping that a lot of the streaming services will be working to to you know improve their quality. But as far as getting a download that's going to have a lot of uh, you know quality CD quality still in there, it's we need to come a, a ways with how you actually 
understanding in the marketplace of what the file is, how you use it. It doesn't work with iTunes, so it's it's sort yeah, of... If it won't play on your player, then people yeah. don't want it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and Kevin, do, do you think that this... I mean, I, I seem to remember when I, when I talked to Kjartan, who was one of the people that work at, at WIMP uh, at uh, South by Southwest, and they were mentioning the fact that actually the high-definition service yields high royalties for artists as well. So do, do you believe that that's going to be a trend that continues uh, on, on this front? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, the thing that worries me most is uh, also what Brian mentioned is that you have all these backroom deals that happen where nobody knows what's really going on. That you know, they, all the all the streaming services get in line to try and be the one to say that they pay artists most, but until you know what's really happening on the back end, you really can't you can't say who's doing what. All I know is what you get when you get your streaming royalty uh, checks, and uh, they're pretty small when comparison to what you were probably seeing in the past yeah and it's a matter of hey once we build a sustainable model where there aren't these backroom deals enabling everything then we can kind of see what's going to be the best economic model for artists and you know that that's that's in my opinion and and a lot of these deals on the high res, high res stuff it, it benefits a small select few um the people that they think they have to have their music in order to even launch and for people to care of course, and uh, uh, I guess I like, uh, uh, squeeze in a little uh, uh, sort of plug on, on what you guys are up to at the moment because uh, I like to do that halfway now because it's, it's a little bit more fun. And, uh, uh, you know, Olivia, on, on your front, uh, uh, how's, how's things going with your, ter your turn? And can you give us uh, like a 20-second overview of the service just for anybody that may have not uh, heard you on the show before or seen the service before? Yeah, sure. So, so your turn is basically a social place where you you take your your turn, uh, and we drop like call to actions for people to express uh, in a different way. So basically, uh, we you all guys know about selfies, about uh, how much like the millennials are expressing themselves and and sharing things with friends. And here it's really about like dropping a topic and getting people to take their turn. Uh, on it by either like drawing something or taking a picture uh, and sharing it to to friends. Um, so in the in the recent uh, uh, development, uh, there's like we obviously work a lot with the music industry and and recently we we did some really cool stuff um, with uh, Pharrell Williams, for instance, or Banks. Yeah. Um, and also we started we we got a lot of brands actually approaching us. Um, and we we are like opening step by step this to uh, to brands, and we worked this summer on a really important campaign with uh, Pepsi mm -hmm. worldwide, and it was in uh, in the context of the World Cup. So it was driving both like uh, like Lionel uh, Messi, for instance, yeah. but also artists that were creating uh, uh, music for for Pepsi, and it's been really uh, successful. And now we like slightly. Uh, step by step, like opening to more more brands, and uh, it's really like taking the essence of your turn, which is like how can you drive engagement yeah. and get this uh, value available for for the brands. Absolutely, that's so fantastic. Really and, exciting. And, the, and the site is yourturn.com, right? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. So go and check it out. It's going to be links in the show notes as well. And Brian, yeah. SF Music Tech is uh, uh, coming up in San Francisco uh, in uh, November. Uh, so uh, any uh, any indication of, of what's going to happen and any early, early uh, leaks on, on uh, uh, attendees or, or cool keynotes yeah. or anything like that? Well, it, it's going to be fabulous as always. And I hope to see a bunch of you there. I know at least one of you, hopefully all three of you, hopefully all... 40,000 of you out there in the audience <laughs> will come, and it's November 11th. It's going to be a great. There's going to be focus on high-quality audio, of course, so I hope to loop in, you know, Deezer and Wimp. We've got Ardio. We've got some rock stars. We've got all sorts of folks, but really it's about coming and moving everything forward, so we're yeah. really, really excited about that, and we're actually, I don't know when this show's going to air, but uh, tomorrow on... Thursday, yeah. on Thursday. Oh, so... Right now, we are announcing the Future of Money and Technology Summit for December 2nd. So nice. futureofmoney.com, that's my other interest. And I actually have a very interesting startup that I'm forming right now uh, that combines uh, music, artists getting paid, and money. So uh, 
Maybe I'll come back in a few weeks and talk about that. But yeah, everything's great. Awesome. So if you guys come to sfmusictech.com, you can find out more about what we're up to and uh, would love to have you there and involved. Awesome. And uh, finally, Kevin, uh, I, we actually plugged City Baby last week because I covered the, in Berlin, uh, we covered the news of City Baby Free. Uh, and, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, on that note or anything else that you want to mention, uh, anything you'd like to plug? Uh, well, yeah, at CD Baby, we've just been doing a lot of work with uh, kind of shoring up our base with our own website and some of right. our music promotion tools. So we have a new music player that uh, uh, we built based on a lot of feedback from our artists, it allows them to feature music. They can create tons of players so bloggers can embed them. They can feature the whole catalog in any order, however they want to put it together. And so that's something we just released. And then on top of that, allowing artists to, to sell music, get their music up on CD Baby without any sort of sign-up fee. Um, just uh, a lot of people that, you know, artists, instead of having stuff scattered about the web, they, they have tracks that are maybe B-sides or live cuts or things that they hadn't wa wanted to distribute. Or, you know, they used it TuneCore or somebody else and wanted to get access to the fan base at CDBaby.com. So now they can without having to pay for distribution. And, and it, it you know, works similar to how Bandcamp works. Awesome. That's great. And that's on citybaby.com. And also check out the uh, DIY uh, musician blog. Uh, I'll put the show notes, uh, the, the, the links yeah. in the show notes as well. And that's uh, another project of Kevin's. And uh, uh, Ardio is back. Ardio, after months of like a complete darkness in terms of uh, uh, news from, from the company, is back. They've launched a redesigned service uh, and they have launched a, a freemium essentially version in, in 20 countries starting today. Uh, that was first reported. reported by Ben Cesario of the New York Times, I believe, and uh, uh, so the, mu the music streaming service had actually dipped its waters. Uh, it's it's dipped its waters, dipped dipped its toes. Uh, I'm losing <laughs> it already. It's it's terrible. And and in the free music space uh, with a, with an, a radio service uh, um, uh, earlier uh, this year, actually late last year, uh, but now it's going fully freemium. And uh, you know it's partnered with Cumulus Media, which means that they're going to be able to serve advertising uh, to uh, the consumers that are listening to the free version of the service uh, uh, with without having to spend a ton of money on uh, hiring a bunch of uh, ad salespeople, which is great for them. And, you know, my question is sort of where it does audio stand now? Uh, of course, the, the, the service hasn't managed to gain the same amount of momentum as uh, uh, Spotify. Uh, and, you know, of course, it's pretty well known and pretty well used uh, within our tech community, uh, but maybe not so much uh, for, with the mainstream public or the public at large. So, uh, but, but Brian, what are your thoughts on audio and, and uh, how do you feel that the company can make a comeback if it does? Well, I mean, RDO is it, it's a solid service. They've got the licenses. They've got a good team. They just bought the Tastemaker X team. I was an advisor over there. You know, they, they're doing so much tie-ins and partnerships that you know and they have a huge amount of money backing them and they're able to do these huge deals so i mean you know on one chance one side you know everyone could get bored and the plug could get pulled but on the other hand they might be able to do these partnership deals on a scale that is really hard for the other folks to do and and um you know it's 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 a good service. So when you have an offering that's a good service, but you're not getting the traction, what right. do you do? Right. You do certain things. They're doing, you know, the, the higher res audio. Okay, we're going to upgrade. Okay, so now there's other competitors in the space, but they're there too. You, you know, you do the deal with Cumulus, where I think they're getting, I, I don't know if the number's public, but they're getting like a huge amount of, of ads and publicity yeah. that they don't actually have to pay for. And I don't see anyone else going out there and, and doing these like huge, huge, where like hundreds of millions of people are going to be exposed to the messaging. So, uh, you know, I mean, they, they've, got, they've got as good a shot <laughs> as almost anyone who's not owned by Apple. Nice, nice. <laughs> I like it. It was it was a diplomatic answer. And and uh, 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 Olivia, on your on your front, uh, of course, uh, we're here in Europe. Uh, uh, Ardio is perhaps stronger in the states. Uh, you know, how how do you feel about the service right now? And the redesign is beautiful, by the way. Like, if people haven't checked it out, they should go and download the Ardio app and and give it a go because it's it's a beautiful redesign. I was about to say, like, they they're always amazing me with uh, with uh, product. To be honest, I have not seen today, but. Uh, it's uh, it's really a company that has like a culture of doing like super sleek uh, products and and uh, 
caring about about the users then it's been it's been i really agree with uh, brian on that like they they are incredibly smart with the the biz dev they are doing like shazam deal was was really good and they did tons of other um uh, deals where you really get at a, an, an emotional connection for the user where it makes sense yeah. and i think uh, on that level like rdo has been really uh, uh, amazing then like for for some reasons like you know maybe it's uh they're not as different or or spotify is too much or i don't know but they never made it to to get really like a, a strong success yeah. uh, and in europe it's true that they they have a challenge with uh, with the brand um but but they have solid finance behind and they have looks like they have time and sometimes being patient is a uh, is a good uh, it's a good uh, strategy Absolutely, absolutely, and and uh, Kevin, of course, uh, you probably know m more than uh, all of us uh, uh, what the, the Im financial impact of Ardio is. But of course, you're uh, not in, in in the position to disclose that. But w what is your what, what are your thoughts about about Ardio? You know, as somebody that works in the space uh, uh, 24 seven and uh, sort of sees how people are are making use of, of different services. Well, I mean, we have some uh, folks here at CD Baby that are diehard Ardio users that love the interface and still think it's superior to, to what Beats is doing. And um, uh, me personally, uh, you know, I feel like if they're not tied to a device, it's going to be a tough road. Um, it seems like Spotify has been able to, to tackle the, the market with uh, people listening at work on their desktops and, and some yeah. in the mobile space. But uh, um, it, it seems like without some sort of like bigger hook than just redesigning it's free so a lot more people will try it out now yeah um but it's still i can go listen to whatever i want on spotify so why would i come to rdo when i can't do that so that that's where i feel like things are going to fall but uh they they do have amazing design i i, I will give them that that uh um that uh, they they do put together a very nice interface. I personally would like every all of the multiple services to catch on, so there's some good competition, and that uh, it doesn't just become one person dominating the market. But it seems like these days, if you don't have if you're not tied to a device, it's really hard to get 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 you know known and, but, and but get people. But there using is it. that device uh, that Giannis and them have built. I forget the name. It looks like a cone. But everyone says it's really, really cool. So maybe that was that. there. Oh, uh, well, next show we, you can cover it. Right. Uh, but it's a beautiful looking device. And uh, maybe their attack on, you know, what's beyond Sonos. Um, and that, that may be uh, a, a, a another point of entry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's exciting stuff. And, uh, you know, I... Uh, I, I'm giving it another go now, and I think you know. I, I, I seem to remember a few months ago, or maybe like a, even a year or two ago, that I, I, somebody at Spotify was talking about the timeline of, of users converting from free to premium, and it was a fairly long period of time. You know, it took like six to twelve months uh, for a lot of users to actually jump the ship and decide to go and, and pay for the service, and uh, if, until it became indispensable essentially for them. So the fact that they are becoming a free service could lead a lot more people to try it out in the long in the long term, and then eventually decide to switch. So uh, mm -hmm. it's definitely a long a long game here that they have to play with uh, with, with users. Uh, Spotify uh, announced a brand new uh, toolkit for brand that want to make an impact in the advertising side of, of, of the company, of course, on the free uh, portion of the service. So uh, perhaps they realize that they need to monetize the service a little better when it comes to advertising, and they can probably charge more for uh, video content. And uh, the company, in fact, introduced uh, a new video feature, uh, which uh, also allows uh, complete takeovers of uh, the Spotify uh, uh, client. And uh, uh, it will also work on mobile. So if you are uh, using the free version of, of Spotify, on, on, on a tablet or, or on a mobile phone, of course, uh, with different functionality between the two, uh, you're going to get a video advert that starts playing, uh, and uh, uh, brands will have the opportunity to actually sponsor uh, that uh, you know view of, of the video, of the advert, uh, and provide you with 30 minutes of uninterrupted playback if you experience the entire advert, so which could be 15 or 30 seconds. So uh, this kind of, it's funny, because this uh, reminded me of the company Guvera that launched in Australia a few years ago, and they were uh, doing brand tie-ups, and the brands were sponsored sponsoring the listening experience of the users and this seems to have come around uh, into Spotify in a sense. Uh, uh, so uh, 
I guess, uh, Olivier, on, on your front, uh, how do you feel about this? Uh, uh, how do you think users will take to adverts taking over their uh, Spotify client uh, that are used to the, to the normal audio adverts and, and sort of uh, more marginal video, uh, um, you know, uh, interactive advertising on, on, on the yeah. platform? It's, it's so, I mean, so many times I felt we were not taking the, the opportunity to do more advertising, more smart advertising on, on free streaming services. Um, and, and it's really good news to see Spotify arriving there and, as you said, like probably trying to charge more for what they give. Yeah. And, and they can really give, like, charge more because music is so cool. There is so value for that. Um, and I think, to me, like, the most important thing is like video. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it sounds a little bit uh, bizarre at start, but like video is like something where you can guarantee to the brands that you have like a completed view, uh, a real engagement. Um, and if it's the right brand, uh, and I think it's really a good proposal. Yeah. Then on a consumer level, the proposal to tell you like, listen, you're going to have to watch now that video that is 15, 30 seconds. Um, but for that, I'm going to give you like 30 minutes free of any ads. I think it's quite cool. It's, uh, it's much more uh, interesting. They ask me for a little bit of attention, but then I have 30, 30 minutes for, for free. Um, and it's maybe less uh, intrusive than the audio that it's always the same voice, etc. And, and that you, you like, you just hate it. So I think it's a smart move from... Uh, from Spotify and, and I think the market is also uh, like both the company and the market are, are desperate to find great way to reach uh, the new audience. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I guess, uh, uh, you know, uh, Brian, in, in for me, this feels like a a move that should lead to uh, a better monetization and of course a you know a, a easier uh, turn into profitability for spotify of course that's their ultimate goal uh, i was wondering about granularity though so i don't know if you had any thoughts on that um, i saw that the brand partners uh, include ford mcdonald's coca-cola nbc universal pictures and nike uh, so in that sense it just doesn't feel like they're going to be able to deliver the granularity that we're hoping for well i mean making it easier to pump more money into these systems is is I mean, it's it's necessary. I mean, we're right. talking about you know a, a whole bunch of new systems coming into the marketplace like now. So uh, you know, when when you make it easier for people to pump money in, that supports the whole ecosystem. So you know, is the experience going to be as good? Well, if if it's done well, hopefully it will be. But uh, uh, you know, but but. When you can get more big brands vying for the same exposure, the rates go up, and that helps the services, and that right. helps the artists. Hopefully, depending on the deals, and you know, it's not it's not a bad thing. I mean, I know the last time Kevin and I were on your show, we, there was a big debate about you know beats and whether right. you know, oh my God, it's horrible because there's no free tier, and I'm like, well. If you have to support the 97% that isn't going to pay a monthly fee, it's a very, very different economics. And yeah. it comes a point in time, you've got to stop running these loss leaders if you don't want to take a loss. And if you're going to, maybe instead of stopping running it, you change it a different way where there's direct monetization and you can totally figure out if that 30 second ad is going to cover the 30 minutes of listening and sometimes yeah. you know i mean i'm i'm a dot com guy but i'm also a business guy and i really like it when money actually flows in a greater amount than what the service cost to provide and, you know One of those old, it's time old school business, it as a guys. business as opposed to just you know going for market share so i think it's it's yeah. it's it's a no-brainer <laughs> that it's good it may or may not be a better experience for the people who are listening without paying but you know you got to pay for you know there's got to be money flowing through the system so it's yeah. good yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Kevin, uh, do you, do you, I guess you, you welcome this as well. I mean, from, from the point of view of the artist that's trying to make a living out of this, uh, you know, monetizing free is still important. I mean, there's a lot of people that are listening to free streaming services today. So, Yeah, I, I, I think to me, as, as long as they execute it in a way that doesn't, it, you know, 
make a horrible user experience yeah. where there's flashing ads and everything where you don't even want to be on the site anymore, then then I think it's a good step for them to, you know, they got to make more ad revenue. I mean, the, Brian's right. You got to support the freeloaders. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess you got to pay for them somehow. But, yeah. you know, if it's done well, it it could open up some conversations about uh, artists getting more money from that if, you know, based on, you know, if your music's getting a high click-through rate, then maybe you deserve a bigger cut and not just being, you know, similar to what happens over at YouTube. So, Absolutely. who knows? Absolutely. And uh, I'd like to mention also on this, uh, talking about Spotify, that uh, uh, Elliot Van Buskirk, who was an uh, editor of Evolver.fm, which was an Econest, uh, the, the editorial arm of the Econest, uh, has uh, uh, launched a new uh, site, uh, which is uh, Spotify Insights, uh, which is on insights.spotify.com. Com. And right. uh, uh, there's going to be a blog where he analyzes some of the data that comes from uh, the consumption of music on the streaming service and uh, if sort of put a, a, a journalistic editorial spin on that and uh, uh, tell us interesting things about how people are consuming music. And the first post is uh, around uh, uh, the journey of genres that originated in Berlin, London and Paris and it's well worth a read. So uh, go and check out insights.spotify.com and best of luck to Elliot with this new venture which looks really interesting. And uh, um, just want uh, to uh, introduce a quick interview that I recorded uh, uh, just a couple of hours ago with uh, Mike McCready, the CEO of Music X-Ray, a company that is uh, heavily involved in the Future Music Forum in Barcelona. I'm heading out there uh, next week for a couple of days, and so he's going to tell us a little bit about uh, what's going to go uh, down there and a little bit about Music X-Ray. So, uh, really great to welcome uh, Mike McCready to the show, the CEO of Music X-Ray. So hi, Mike, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? It's going great. Uh, thanks for having me on again. I it's, love your. I've, I've become an avid reader of your uh, of your of your site. Uh, it's great to have you. And so uh, I wanted to uh, uh, sort of catch up quickly about uh, both the Future Music Forum in Barcelona that's happening next week, and about yeah. Music X Ray. So uh, you know, first of all, about the Future Music Forum. So w what's exciting you this year? Of course, uh, it's a two-day conference for people that don't know about it. Uh, uh, that's happening in Barcelona. It's been going on for a few years now. Uh, I went to uh, at least two editions beforehand. So uh, tell us a little bit about what. What's, what's exciting you about this year's edition? Uh, yeah, it's in its uh, it's in its fifth year. Fifth year, it's, right? uh, Yeah, it gets it gets a little bit bigger every year. Uh, and for this year, we added a day onto the front of it called Music X-Ray Day. So we have about forty industry professionals uh, from major label and R people to uh, music supervisors and licensors that are coming over uh, just for that day, and of course staying also for uh, through Future Music Forum. So they'll be adding a lot to Future Music Forum as well. Um, you know, I think it's it's getting uh, a little higher level. I mean, we've always had top executives come, but it seems like now there's the, there's there's more of them, CEOs of music tech companies. Uh, we have Sam Tarantino this year, who's uh, CEO of Groove Shark, as you know, the founder of Groove Shark. So it'll be interesting to hear uh, what's going on with him. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. A, they got, just got dropped from Chromecast as well, so <laughs> definitely yeah. going to have a good conversation there. Yeah. And there's loads of people, you know, from Mark Mulligan, Scott Cohen, Alex White, Benji Rogers from, from Pledge, uh, uh, a whole host of interesting guests. And uh, I'll be doing a panel as well. We're, we're doing a panel on new revenue streams for artists and labels with uh, uh, Spotify and uh, Music Glue uh, and Cooking Vinyl, which should be great. Uh, so really excited about that one. And yeah, uh, and, yeah, and so, uh, you know, on the, on, you mentioned Music X-Ray uh, earlier. Uh, what's going on with the company? What's been happening in the last year? Oh, wow. Well, we have... Uh, um We've had a lot of things going on this year. Of course, uh, it's sort of a, the same thing with uh, with Future Music Forum. We keep getting uh, deeper and deeper adoption uh, with the major labels on Music X-Ray. Um, we've uh, added a lot more features to help uh, industry professionals identify songs that are high um high potential or high high market potential songs and talent uh so these tools have enabled a lot of the industry professionals to simply mine them from our site a lot of times even when they're not submitted uh songs that were uh, uh you know for a specific opportunity they can still uh mine our site for quality uh based on you know, the collective uh, ratings of all of the industry professionals. It's a very cool system. That's awesome. And I, I get alert, uh, alerts every now and again. It seems like there's some really interesting opportunities on the site for uh, songwriters and musicians that are looking for uh, for placement. So uh, pretty exciting stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mike, it was such a pleasure having you on. Uh, for people that are looking to find more information about either, uh, they need to head to futuremusicforum.com uh, for the conference. Of course, it's a little bit late now if you're coming from overseas to book travel. But if you, if you can make 
Kit and Do. And uh, also for Music X Ray, of course, it's musicxray.com and you can find all the information about the company there. Mike, thanks so much for joining me today and uh, uh, look forward to seeing you next week. And we're back, and it's going to be the last uh, story of today. Uh, <laughs> we, have a, we have a lot of ground to cover, uh, but this uh, last story again uh, goes into talking more gen- generally about monetization and uh, it's uh, uh, around Twitter so another big company and uh, no startups this week uh, it's all fairly established players in the industry but uh, uh, Twitter announced uh, uh, that they would uh, begin testing a buy button on a small bu- uh, number of users so uh, this buy button will not redirect our users to a website or uh, you know a third party company that's uh, selling the goods but it will actually create the transaction right within the app uh, you just have to add your, your credit card uh, services uh, credit card details for the first time and then after that you just going to be able to buy stuff directly and uh, they are doing this uh, through the company Stripe which incidentally was actually also uh, an Apple uh, a partner for the Apple uh, the new Apple Pay program uh, so given that the majority of artists have uh, that you know uh, the majority of users that have millions and millions of, of followers are artists uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they make use of this buy button and if they can convert some of their followers into actually hard cash so uh, on that note uh, you know uh, Kevin I guess I'll start with you because you guys uh, uh, do all sorts of different types of sales and, and uh, how do you feel this can affect uh, uh, the way musicians uh, are able to sell stuff on Twitter and, and uh, are you excited about this I mean I think it could be pretty cool around both CD sales and merchandise sales uh, you know what? I've never been all that excited about selling on Twitter. Chirpify came out a few years back and didn't really seem to catch on. It's just nothing right. that when I'm on Twitter, I'm not I'm not shopping. That's right. me personally. I'm there reading stuff. When I go shopping for something, I like to do research and and price comparisons. And I don't really see uh, an impulsive buy button in Twitter. Frankly, I'd be more concerned I'd hit it when I didn't want to buy something than <laughs> than. Uh, than when I did, but you know, I, I don't know. I haven't. I've seen companies, you know, like Tripify test this and not really catch on. Twitter may be able to do some sort of integration that works better. Um, to me, it's it's not. It doesn't really fit uh, what, in my opinion, what people are trying to do on Twitter. That's interesting. Like I, I was just thinking about uh, for artists, it could be interesting if you have if you're playing on that impulse purchase kind of feeling that oh we got this limited edition thing or we got this coming out you know and you can buy it with a click. But I, I don't know, uh, uh, Olivia. Well, how do you feel about this? Um, so it's really interesting because you're saying like if you tweet etc. My question is like let's say you tweet now about something exclusive, so a collector uh, DVD of uh, of the show today, 200 episodes. And I click on that, what's happening? And, and it's going to be like how easy they make it to, for me to create my account with my credit card, etc. Yeah. Because the, the, the complexity of, uh, of the transaction is that moment. It's trust and how easy it is. Um, so yesterday we saw Apple coming with uh, Apple Pay and, and uh, it's quite amazing how it's, they are not inventing this, but they're going to be able to scale this uh, at a... Uh, in an incredible way yeah. and the question is now how twitter can handle that part because to me it's where there is the complexity yeah. then for for um i agree with uh, with kevin like when you're on twitter you're not necessarily here like to to buy immediately something uh, but still like for ticketing some merchandising that is exclusive etc for sure it has a, it has an impact Cool. Uh, and uh, Brian, last word uh, uh, to you on the on the story. Come uh, on, guys! It's uh, a game changer. This is going to change <laughs> everything. You know, I was uh, I felt really you good know, about this. Uh, you know, you it's, mentioned some other <laughs> company hoser company that Twitter hated and said that didn't work. But the Stripe guys, we featured them in Future of Money. They they get it. And when you have an artist who's got millions of followers posting about something it may not get that much traction you know but if i'm out there selling you know a couple hundred dollar tickets and it turns into thousands and thousands of dollars of sales or you know zoe keating when she's out there doing her thing and all of a sudden you know thirty thousand people buy her cd you know that's a house so (laughs) i think this is a real game changer you're assuming you're assuming they're not buying it because they weren't on So Twitter here's before. the story. It's not a matter of that. But what'll happen often is I'll hear about something on Twitter. It's scrolling down my screen. I'll be like, oh yeah, I gotta think about that later when I'm not on the bus. And I never get yeah. back to it. 
But if it's like, buy it and I can click on it, that's, that's, you know, it's, we have such a short attention span theater as, as epitomized by Twitter. So if all of a sudden, instead of being, oh, that's cool, I should think about looking it up sometime later, if all of a sudden that's changed to, oh, there's a cool event tonight, and I know that that's coming, you know, Eventbrite doesn't have the integration yet, which I really, really want, uh, but yeah. down the road, I think everyone will be integrated I think it's a total awesome major cash generating game changer. I think for events that's going to be really interesting because if you can literally you can buy do, yeah. buy the ticket from from there and you see somebody like Olivia tweets about uh, yeah a, an event that he's going to next week and yeah go, last oh, this minute cool. ticket and, who wants it now boom click buy go to the show game changer yeah it's a lot fr it's frictionless right because otherwise you have to click on the link and even if it is an event bride you still have to probably be redirected to the app and sort of go through all that rigmarole. Uh, if you can do it on Twitter, then it becomes a lot easier. But it's all going to come down to, I guess, what kind of money they are charging for this and how companies feel about Game giving, that, giving that chunk away to Twitter. But yeah, it's, <laughs> I'm excited about it. Uh, but in, in I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come, I'm gonna come down firmly on the side of the results are going to be very disappointing. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I like it. I like a bit of a uh, bit of a controversy on the show, and uh, uh, that's pretty much it. I I, I don't even want to go there. I, I I'd put the Garth Brooks Ghost Tunes story in the lineup, but I just don't think there's any point talking about it. Uh, it's <laughs> it's literally like demoralizing to read about. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if anybody. I'm not so sure. Can I talk about it for about ten yeah, seconds? Sure, I'll sure. try to keep it to that. <laughs> so here's the story. Anytime you have a new product that people can pay $30 for and most of the money goes to the artist, it may only be tight towards their fan base, but that's really, really good. Right. The services, and I don't think he's even on the other services, I'm a Garth fan, I listen to the album, he gets, I don't even want to guess the tiny amount of money. It's like when Bon Jovi did his free concert online, it was free to everybody, 30 minutes, then it said, okay, Unless you're a member of the fan club, you're done. And then the people to listen to the last two hours had to sign up to his fan club. It started at $59.95 and went up to thousands of dollars. Any chance you give the fan to give $30 directly to the artist, that's good. In yeah. my humble opinion, it is. Though it it's is. True, but at the same time, the service does not seem as compelling as it should. There's absolutely no need to create an entire service around it. I, you know I, what I said last week? That it was. It, it's the most expensive affiliate sale scheme ever to create an entire service around <laughs> around the and off that's chance. That's a big that question. I think we're going to see a lot of as we move forward in the next couple of months. Artists creating their own services and how that will play out both for those artists as well as the entire ecosystem. Right, right. Yeah, you know, my, my take was like, do something else. Like, either give, the, the, you know, a lossless download or do something else other than just being a straight up download store. But yeah, <laughs> that was my take on it. <laughs> Uh, but no, it's exciting. You know, it's thirty bucks. If you're if you're a fan of his, of course you can get the entire back catalog, which is great because he never put it up on uh, digital formats. He, he was one of the last uh, holdouts, really. There's not that many left uh, anymore these days. And uh, and I think with that we have come to the end of the show. And uh, uh, it, it was a pretty uh, big one today. I, I'm, I'm, it, it was exciting. Happy anniversary! And, and exhausting. And yeah. yeah, it was the anniversary. So Correct. thank you so much for joining me today on this anniversary episode of uh, Digital Music Trends. I would have loved to do an event but I, I've just been running around the last three weeks uh, between Cologne and Berlin and Barcelona next week so I didn't get a chance to uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, at some point I will do some drinks soon in London uh, that will be fun uh, I don't do events that's that's your, your business Brian I, 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 can't, I can't do this <laughs> <I'll take it laughs> even just the idea of booking a venue I'm just like oh my god <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> yeah. it's too much for me uh, and uh, no, th thanks so much for joining me guys it was uh, such a pleasure having you again cdbaby.com sfmusictech.com and your turn and uh, uh, thanks so much for listening. You can find out more on digitalmusictrans.com. Also check out the DMT One to One Show, which comes out every week. And I'd also like to thank uh, the sponsor of this podcast, the Play MPE. And uh, you can find more on plaympe.com. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week, and until uh, next time. <laughs> <laughs>